Well, when Dawn and I first got married, first meal she ever cooked for me was something called Bavarian meatloaf. I won't tell you what it all is in it, but just Bavarian meatloaf. And we were in this small house, and this was not her fault. She's a good cook. But when she used the stove in this old rundown house, the people who had lived there before us had sprayed the oven down, okay? But they didn't clean the stuff off. So she puts the food in there, puts it in front of me. She's so excited. We just got married. I want to, I want to display my cooking skills to my new husband. What do you think? I took a bite and I said, because I'm, look, I'm very diplomatic. I know how to work with people. I said, this is quite possibly the worst thing I have ever eaten. <laughs> now, she was crushed. It was, it, it, but it's, and it wasn't her fault. And I said, well, well I'm, not, I'm not fussing at you. I'm not criticizing you. I'm criticizing the food. <laughs> then the thought hit me. I don't want you to listen to this. The thought hit me. When you despise the creation, you are despising the creator. And a core value of Christianity is a respect for human life. We believe God is our creator. And when you despise the creation, you're despising the creator. And this is part of the whole Judeo-Christian worldview. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. When God created the human race, it says God created man in his own image. In other words, there's something different about human beings. I love you, but your, your fur babies don't have the image of God. There's something special and significant about you. Jesus says the same thing. Matthew 5.22, he says, don't call anybody racha. Don't call anybody worthless. Luke 14, 13, Jesus says, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. In other words, those that society says have no worth, Jesus says, no, they have intrinsic worth. You invite them. Does this make sense? This is part, if you, look, if you're a Christian with a Christian worldview, if this book called the Bible shapes your worldview, you have to have respect for life. This is another area where the Christian worldview conflicts with the naturalistic, utilitarian, Darwinian worldview. If you are a Darwinist, if you are an evolutionist, and we have some here in the church, then if you're going to be consistent with your worldview, you need to kill the lame, the blind, and those with Down syndrome. You say, no, I'm a Darwinist, but I don't believe we ought to kill them. That's great, but you're inconsistent with your worldview. A man from uh, Princeton University, Peter Singer, got in some trouble a few years ago because he talks about euthanasia for the, the, the uh, handicapped, the deformed, and also uh, the old folks who can't contribute anything in life. He got in a lot of trouble, but he said, wait, I'm just being consistent with my Darwinian worldview, you see. Here's my, here's my thing. Either Hollywood or science or the age that you're living in is going to shape your brain or that book called The Bible Is. And so that's why I want us to go to the Word of God today and see what the Bible says about the value of human life. So I want you to turn to Acts chapter 3, if you would. Acts chapter 3. And as you're turning there, let me give you a, uh, a background of this. The church is, we, we've been going through the book of Acts. Church has just gotten started. People baptized in the Holy Spirit. How many people were saved in one day? 3,000. So now it started out with 120, 3,120, and it's growing, according to Acts chapter 2. And as this church is growing, there are two leaders that emerge, Peter and John. And it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they are going to the temple to pray. And uh, Peter and John are an interesting pair. They grew up together. They were in a fishing business together on the Sea of Galilee. They prepared the Last Supper together. In fact, when Jesus was raised from the dead, Mary said, I've seen them. Who are the first two that ran back to the tomb? Peter and John. So these guys are are good friends. They're going at 3 o'clock to the temple to pray, and they go to a gate called the Beautiful Gate. You see that in verse 2. We have a PowerPoint picture of an artist's recreation of that. Uh, I don't know. Darla and I are going to be taking folks to Israel this time next year. It looks like we'll be taking folks. We probably won't be taking you to the top of the Temple Mount. It's getting pretty rough up there. But, But in the past, we've taken folks to the top, and that's where this takes place. And this beautiful gate, Josephus says, was the largest gate in the temple compound, 75 foot high, 60 foot wide, made with brass and plates of gold. It took 20 men to open and shut this gate. And so Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Let's stand as we read the word. And why do you do this, Pastor? Why do we stand? Is it just a No. It's because this book will be your guide, or Hollywood will be your guide. This book will be your guide, 
or the demonic spirit of this age will be your guide. And so we stand in honor of the inspired, inerrant word of God. Look at this. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along. whom They used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. This, This beggar fascinates me. Because the Bible says he was lame from his mother's womb. In other words, he was born with some type of congenital defect. And the Greco-Roman world had no value for children born with birth defects. The Roman statesman Cicero, have y'all heard of Cicero? Cicero said this, deformed infants shall be killed. Deformed could be defined as sickly or even wrong gendered. If you wanted a boy and you got a girl, you could kill him. The Stoic philosopher Seneca, who lived from 4 B.C. to about 65 A.D., said this, quote, Mad dogs we knock on the head, illegitimate children we destroy, and we drown even children at birth who are weakly and abnormal. And the, the philosophy on this is, well, these kids are a drain on society. They have nothing to offer society. Food is limited. They don't have a, um, a welfare system like we have. So if food is limited, we're going to give the food to the kids who can grow up and be strong and provide for us. Why would we waste food on children who have nothing to provide to society? And you see that mentality here. In verse 2, this man had to ask for alms. Verse 2, he had to literally, he couldn't even walk to the place to be dropped off and begged. People had to pick him up and carry him. This man had nothing to offer to society. So you need to understand this. In the Greco-Roman world, this man really did not have much value. But Peter and John have a Christian worldview, and they understand even if, from the world standpoint, this man has nothing to offer, he is still stamped with the image of God. He still has value. If Jesus, listen to me, They have this Christian worldview now that says if this man had been the only one ever born, Jesus would have still come to earth and died for his sins. That's the value God places on one human being. And so Peter and John have this value for human life, and you see this in three ways. Number one, here's the first way we see the value they have on this man. The first public miracle after they are baptized in the Holy Spirit was not to a rich man that could pay them back was not to a Roman official that could kind of elevate them and bring a lot of status to this new movement called Christianity. No, no. Their first public miracle after they're baptized in the Spirit is to a poor man who can contribute nothing. Now, there have been other signs and wonders. You see that in chapter 2, verse 43, in the context of the church. But this is the first public ministry. That's how we see they place value on this man. Second way we see how they place value on this man is verse 4. It says, they fixed their gaze on him. When you see a beggar, when you're in an intersection, and the guy's there, what do we do? We typically look away, right? We suddenly have a very urgent phone call that we have to take. We look down, we look away, but we don't want to be confronted, so we don't look at the person. And you you don't see Peter and John do this. Verse 4, it says, they looked at the man. I wonder how many people had gone by for days, weeks, months, years, never even seen this guy. Maybe, you know, giving a coin every now and then. Most of them just ignored them. Peter and John stopped and said, no, no, you have value. We're going to look at you. Another way we see the value, verse 11, I remember as a kid, verse 11, always kind of made me smile. Because now you see this lame man 
who has been healed, it says he's clinging to Peter and John. Almost like these men have changed my life. These are two of my best friends right now. Have I introduced y'all to Peter and John? They're my best buddies, and he's just kind of clinging to them. And they're not saying, get away from me. You're smelly. You're, no, no. They're now saying, yeah, we're, we're friends. You have intrinsic worth in the eyes of God, and because you have intrinsic worth in the eyes of God, you have intrinsic worth in our eyes. So listen to me. And this is a tough sermon to preach. And I, I was all week, I've been saying, I don't even know if I ought to preach on this. Listen, let it go. Because I, I honestly, y'all going to think I'm crazy. I, I want to have a reputation of if you're down and upset or whatever, come to RFA Church and Pastor Chad will build you up. I want a little, I want the spirit of Joel Osteen to be upon me and make everybody happy. I, I really, honestly, I do. <laughs> but I can't this morning. If you're going to be a Christian, you're going to claim the name of Jesus, you will have to value human life. There's no way around it. And let's start with this thing of abortion. We have godly women. Some of the most godly women in our church have had abortions. They made a bad decision. They regret it. They've asked for God's forgiveness. They've received his grace, and they've received his mercy. Statistically, Lots of you ladies here have had abortions. I'm not here to twist the knife. And the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us from how much unrighteousness? All unrighteousness. But those godly ladies also, if you were to ask them, what is the biggest regret of your life? They would say the, the abortion we had. The fourth week after conception, there's consciousness. Eight weeks after conception, everything is there. Fingerprints and everything. I hate to break it to y'all. Y'all have been played for a sucker. Y'all been told for a long time, it's just a mass of cells, it's just an embryo, it's just a vital tissue mass. Do you know they have always known it was a human being? Y- y'all bought this mess because you want to be popular and because Hollywood wants you to buy this mess, but they've been lying to you. They've, n- <laughs> they've known all along it was a human being. In fact, Pastor John Lindell preached an incredible sermon on, on abortion he talks about John Piper. John Piper's a pastor, or was a pastor in Minnesota. And he took a, an abortionist out to lunch, a, a notorious abortionist in his community. And he said, I'm, I'm just going to dialogue with him as a pastor. And he said, I had a list of ten reasons why the unborn are human beings. I have my list ready. We sit down to eat. I start going through my list, and the abortionist stops me. And here's what he says. John, I know that. I know we're killing children. I know that we're slaughtering the unborn. I know that. But it would be a greater injustice to rob women of their rights to reproductive freedom. Beloved, they've always known. And so recently, on January 22nd, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo signed a horrific new abortion law into being. Here's what the New York legislature legalized. Can I just say this? This might be a good week to leave me alone on taking issue. Take the issue with me on speaking in tongues, gay marriage, all that. Leave me alone on this one. Number one, according to the law, non-physicians are now allowed to perform abortions in New York. Number two, it allows abortions up to the point of delivery. Number three, it removes protections for infants who survive abortions. So if the child was supposed to be aborted at nine months in the womb and the child comes out alive, you can now kill the child. In fact, I was watching Fox News before I came over here today, and there was a panel of about four or five adults on there talking. Some of them are professionals, doctors, whatever. And um, here's what they all had in common. We survived abortions. We were supposed to have been aborted, and we're alive. But this removes that protection. And then number four, it removes penalties for the death of an unborn child. Before this time, if you killed a woman who was pregnant, you could be prosecuted for her death and the death of the unborn. Now that's been removed. And to celebrate the passing of the law that night, January 22nd, the One World Trade Center was lit in pink. Ironically, at the base of that very building lit up in pink is a monument to the 11 unborn children who died on 9-11. At the top, we're celebrating their death, and at the bottom, we're remembering their death. And when the governor signed into law this thing allowing 
full-term babies who come out alive if they were supposed to have been aborted to be killed when this most grisly, barbaric, demonic piece of legislation I've ever heard of was signed into law, here's the reaction. Congratulations. Beloved, you realize you cannot have a Christian worldview and applaud something like that. You understand that is shaking the fist in the hand of Almighty God. And then Virginia, a couple days later, followed suit. Delegate Kathy Tran introduced legislation to roll back limitations on abortion and allow abortions up to the point of birth. If a baby is nine months in the womb, and during delivery, the mother decides she doesn't want the baby, the baby can be killed. Incidentally, every OBGYN I researched said there's no reason to abort a baby in the ninth month. There's no reason. Ironically, on January 9th, the same day this lady filed this bill, she also filed a bill prohibiting a specific canker worm in Virginia from being targeted by pesticides. A few days later, Virginia Governor... Ralph Northam, himself a physician, was on a radio show, and he was asked about this abortion bill that Kathy Tran had introduced, and he was asked this question, well, what if the abortion doesn't work and the full-term baby comes out alive? What then? He said, well, place the baby on the table, try to keep it comfortable, then have a discussion with the physicians about what the options are. That's not abortion now. That's, that's murder. That's infanticide by any definition. Now, Some of us were really upset about that. The rest of culture was not upset at all about that until a few days later, pictures surfaced of that same governor 30 years before in a picture in blackface or in a KKK outfit. Now, that's a horrible picture. Can I just give you a little self-disclosure? The the KKK thing has always scared me. We we got a lady in the church that is absolutely petrified of clowns. She gets really sick. The KKK thing, that's always scared me. And I'm not even black, so I, I, I don't understand. I know y'all's reaction, and I know some of y'all have really, that, that really, honestly, that, that upsets you. It upsets me. But I love what Matt Walsh said. If you're more upset about an inappropriate costume a guy wore 30 years ago than the fact that he advocated for infanticide three days ago, you are morally deranged and quite possibly psychotic. Now, just so you'll know what's going on here, I, I, uh, I'm going to catch enough grief, so I'm not going to walk you through what happens during a partial birth abortion procedure. If I were to do that, it would turn stomachs all over the place. And we've got kids here, and I, I want to be very careful. J- just so you understand, this is not a clean, sanitized procedure. This is a grisly, barbaric procedure. And I'm going to go back. If you have the same worldview as Peter and John, where human beings have intrinsic life, you cannot support this thing. And there's another abortion procedure. This abortion procedure is called the induced labor abortion or live birth abortion. It's, uh, drugs are given to the, to the mother, and she's forced to deliver the baby prematurely. Nurse Jill Stanick witnessed one of these. Ironically, why, while working at Christ Hospital in Oaklawn, Illinois. How's that? She said one night a nursing co-worker was taking an aborted Down syndrome baby who was born alive to our soiled utility room because his parents did not want to hold him and she did not have time to hold him. I could not bear the thought of this suffering child dying alone on a soiled utility room table, so I cradled and rocked him for 45 minutes. He was 21 to 22 weeks old, weighed about a pound, and was about 10 inches long. He was too weak to move very much, expending any energy he had trying to breathe Toward the end, he was so quiet that I couldn't tell if he was still alive unless I held him up to the light to see his heart beating through his chest wall. And after he was pronounced dead, we folded his little arms across his chest and wrapped him in a tiny shroud. That's a bunch of crap. And the thing that makes me upset is you're more offended by the fact that I've just said crap than that legalized infanticide has taken place in America. That's that's what bothers me. And I'm going to back it, I'll say it again. 
If you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot stand for that mess. You can't support it. You can't support candidates who support that. Now, listen. Listen to me. We wouldn't, hey, we wouldn't do that to an animal. In Massachusetts, did you know this? I, I checked that. I heard Pastor John Little say this. I said, that can't be true. I looked it up and I read the statute. It's true. Do you know in Massachusetts, it is illegal to transport pregnant lobsters because of what it might do to little lobsters? How twisted is that? Well, Pastor Chad, what about rape and incest? Okay, that's 1% or less of all abortions. So let me ask you this. Can we put that 1% aside for just a second and stipulate that all the other abortions are bad or are all those okay and you're just using that as an excuse to make sure that they're all covered, okay? In fact, I'll even do this. Let me give you the 1%. What about the other 99%? Here are the reasons women get abortions. 1% victims of rape and incest. 12% Fetal abnormalities. Darn, can I tell the story of the little girl or is that too whatever? Okay. Um, Darla this past week celebrated the birthday of a 17-year-old girl who Darla says is one of those sweet, godly girls she knows. And when that girl was in the womb, the parents were told she has spinal bifida and you need to abort her. Why would you want to make her have that kind of life? Abort her. The parents said no. And she did come out with spinal bifida. And she's been used by God to bless other people. So don't, the, the, the fetal abnormality thing doesn't really help me that much. Or what about Down syndrome? I think, I think the lady that we support at the um, pregnancy center said that when a lady is told she has a Down syndrome child, 90% choose to abort the child. There was a peer-reviewed study recently with a huge sampling published in the American Journal of Medical Genetics, and they said that families of Down syndrome children are actually happier than the rest of the population. They have a more positive outlook on life, and 90% of siblings of Down syndrome children say they are better people because of the sibling with Down syndrome. 1% victims of rape and incest, 12% fetal abnormalities, 25% said we have the abortion because we don't want others to know that we're pregnant, 48% didn't want to be a single mother or had relationship problems, 73% said they can't afford the child, and then 74% said that uh, the child would interfere with their life, whatever that means. So how do we handle this? I, I was dialoguing with one of our members this past week that's written a really well, well-written article on this, Riley Rigg. Riley and I were talking about this, and... Uh, so what do we do? I, I, I said this recently. The church of the 21st century will be more like the church of the 1st century than the church of the 20th century. And the 1st century church had to deal with legalized infanticide. Did you know that? This is nothing new. 1st century church had to operate in a climate where children were discarded and killed. How did they handle that? I want you to see this. Aristotle recommended that parents should be compelled by law to expose deformed or handicapped babies when they're born. Plutarch talked about babies born in Sparta. If you're a baby born in Sparta, you'd be brought before the elders. If the elders thought the baby was puny or deformed, they were taken to a cave underneath this mountain, Mount Tagetus, and they were left to die. That's what happened in the Greco-Roman world. In Rome, unwanted or deformed babies would be taken to the landfill and put on the landfill. Or they'd be taken to the gutters and they'd be put in the gutters. Or they'd be taken to the sewer and put in the sewer. Now, here's what Tertullian said. Tertullian said after dark, Christians would go to the landfill and pick these babies up and clean them off and say, we're adopting you. They'd go to the sewer and wash them off and said. You have the image of God on you. And just as God adopted me, I'm adopting you. That's how Christians did it. And I believe the church of the 21st century is going to have to virtually do what they did in Rome. We're going to have to go to the trash heaps and the dumps and the abortion centers and say to mothers, don't kill your baby. Give them to us. We'll, we'll, we'll take them. I want you to put out the word right now, and I mean this, and I don't know all the logistics behind this, and I know this is going to be financial, it'll get bigger and bigger, and we're going to have to have a system in place, and I probably shouldn't talk about this until we get a system in place, but I want you to put out the word. I don't know how they do Greg's List or Facebook, whatever, I don't get into that stuff. Put out the word. Don't kill your babies. Bring them to RFA Church. We'll take your babies for you. 
I mean that. Now again, I understand they're all okay. Well, about human, aren't you afraid of human trafficking? And I, you know what? I haven't thought this thing through yet. All I know is the church can't sit around while children are being slaughtered. We can't do it. So, are y'all with? I mean, put the word out. If they, if you want to kill your baby, bring them to RFA. We will take your babies. We we will raise your babies for you. This is a Christian value. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have the same worldview as Peter and John, you say, I don't care if they are lame from the mother's womb. I don't care if society says they can't add anything to society. I don't care if they're Down syndrome. I don't care if they're spinal bifida. They have been stamped with the image of God, and we're going to love those kids. That's the Christian worldview. Now, th- th- that's where I wanted to land this morning, but can I, I'm going to add a few more things to this. If you are a Christian and you value human life, not only do you value the unborn, you value, let me give you another example, people of other races. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't say one race is superior or inferior to another. We value every human race. And look, now this thing is always, hey, it's always perplexed me. I called my mama this last week. I said, I want to use this as a sermon illustration, but my mom doesn't lie. I said, is this true? She said, yes, true. When I was, I can't remember, I was like first grade, second grade, we'd gone on a field trip, and she gets a call when we get back from the field trip. And the teacher says, Ms. Harvey, I I need to speak to you. I said, oh, what did Chad do? He's only only second grade. Did he sell drugs? Did he kill something? What did he do? I mean, the teacher was really upset. And she said, okay. The teacher said, are you sitting down? She said, yeah. She said, well, I don't know how to break this to you, but we went on this field trip today. Now, I grew up in a wonderful place. It was 99.9999% white. And it was, I mean, I, I look at it now, it's coming off the whole civil rights thing years later or whatever, not too long after the whole civil rights thing. And she said, we went on this field trip today, and there were some black kids at the playground. And Chad didn't go play with the white kids. He spent all of his time playing with the black kids. And you need to have a talk with them. And I remember... In second grade, not quite understanding what, what the big deal was. And I wonder if when Jesus says, if we're going to come to the kingdom of God, we must come as little children. I wonder if that means lots of different things. And one of the things it could mean is we have a childlike mentality when it comes to this thing of race. And look, we deal with this periodically. I mean, I've had African Americans tell me that they have family, friends, and members, and folks that I love, whatever, uh, ask him, why do you go to that RFA church? That pastor's white. He doesn't understand the struggle. And he shaved his head. He's obviously a neo-Nazi. Why, why would you go to that church? <laughs> We've had white friends email us and say, we're not coming back. We're leaving your, the church. Why? Well, you obviously like the black people more than you like the white people. I can't win for losing. I might just start a Hispanic church, okay? Just, <laughs> we'll give it whatever. Hey, I thought this as well. I thought, I'm just going to show my ignorance and whatever. I thought all Hispanics just got along with each other. And I had Hispanic people, no, 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 no. And I don't know how the, the Dominicans don't like the Puerto Ricans, who don't like the Mexicans, who don't like the Colombians, who like whatever. Why the division? Can, can we just stop doing the race thing? I, I, I don't know. Can we just, let's just not do it. I mean, because I, I don't think we realize, church, we, we actually have a really good thing going here. Don't, don't let the world divide us over this issue. Somebody the other day was telling me about this great couple they love at our church. And I was like, who are they? And they said, well, they, I, said, I don't know who they are. And they said, well, they're that mixed race couple. I said, you've, you've just defined about half of my church. I, I, <laughs> we, we value unborn human life. We value people of other races. Hey, y'all know how I feel about this whole LGBTQ stuff. I, th- I think it's destroying our society. It's sin. You can't, you can't get away from this. It's sin. But do you know it's possible to say 
as a Bible-believing Christian, I stick to the Word of God and it's sin. And yet, I still look at you and I still see the image of God implanted on you. You are a human being of divine worth. The image of God is in you. Now, they say you can't do that. They say, no, no, you, you take me as a, if you, if you say that I am in a sinful lifestyle, then that automatically by default means you don't think I'm a human being. That's not true. I don't think you're defined by who you sleep with. I think you're defined by the image of God stamped in you. Does that make sense? Um, here, here's another one, and we'll talk about this one, that, that one, the LGBT thing on Wednesday nights. We'll be here on Wednesday night for uh, Cafe 242. We, we value the life of poor people. We value the life of old people. We, we value the life. We value human life. Do you know how many times the Bible talks about this? James is very clear about this. James says, don't let a rich person come to the church and say, because you're rich and you can tithe, you have value. Poor person, you have no value. You sit over there. The Bible says, no, the ground is, here, I'm going to paraphrase the Bible. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. There is intrinsic value in all of us. And we need, in this church and in this pastor right here, a fresh baptism of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I need it. I'll be honest with you. I've had a hard time with Governor Andrew Cuomo lately. I've had a hard time with these people pushing this abortion stuff. And then that thought hit me. Can I give you a profound thought? They're lost. Lost people act lost. Did you know that? Why do we expect lost people to act saved? They're lost. We need a fresh baptism of love for people. I, I was reading a story from Jim Simbla, pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle. Pastor Jim uh, Simbla said that he had closed out his final Easter service one Sunday. He said, I'm down front. It's been a long Easter. I'm worn out. I'm tired. Let me tell you this. Y'all are usually pretty good about this. Don't ever talk to a pastor. Don't ever confront a pastor or disagree with a pastor after he's gotten through preaching. Talk to him later. But that's when you're at your lowest, physically, emotionally, spiritually. So he is drained, and he's tired, and he's down front, and he starts to see this homeless guy come down toward him. He said, he walked, came forward, and I see him three rows back, sheepishly looking at me, and I said to myself, old oh, man, what a day or what a way to end Easter Sunday. Somebody's going to hit me up for money. He said, which happens a lot at Brooklyn Tabernacle. He said, as the man got close to me, he smelled worse than any human being I've ever smelled in my life. The odor was so horrible. The odor of the street, of filth, of sweat, of urine. And he said, when I talked to him, I had to look away to inhale. I would look at him and exhale. I had to look away to inhale. He said, it was a horrendous odor. It made him gag. He said, I pulled out my money to give the homeless guy some money. And the homeless man put his finger in my face and he said, Pastor, I don't want your money. I want this Jesus you were talking about. I want to die on the street. I have no hope in this world unless somebody changes me. And he said, at that moment, I became so convicted of my lack of love, my lack of compassion. And at that moment, I forgot about the homeless man. And I said, God, forgive me. And he said, God baptized me afresh with such love and compassion. He said, I dropped my hands to my side. And the homeless man came against me. He fell his face, his mattered hair. This filthy man fell against my face and my chest and my tie. And I put my arms around him and he said something supernatural miraculous happened he said suddenly that smell changed and suddenly it became the most beautiful perfume I had ever smelled in my life it was as if God was saying it's this smell that I sent you for because it's the smell of the world that Jesus came to die for. He did not die for a nice, clean, neat little world. He came for that which was lost and ruined. And Pastor Simba said that night, that homeless man, David, gave his life to Jesus. The church helped him get a job. Later, he married a lady in the church. And he's used by God today as an associate pastor at a church in New Jersey. Isn't that great? Would you stand with me? I did this first service. I wasn't planning on this, but I did this first service, and I think we need to do it now. Can we close in prayer? I want to pray for three things. Number one, this thing y'all just stood and clapped for, 
bring your babies to us. That sounds great. But we need some strategic planning. We need the Spirit of God to tell us how to make that reality, to take it from theory to reality. God, show us how to do this. God, show us how to physically, actively, practically go out and rescue the perishing and care for the dying. We need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Second thing I I want us to pray for is for that fresh baptism of a love for people, for hurting, dying, homeless, abandoned, needy, foster kids. I need a fresh baptism of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do y'all? Honestly, here's one of the, 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 uh, the dangers about pastoring. It's, it's one of the, the, the dangers of the job. You, you deal with this mess so much, you can get hard and jaded at times. And I just need a fresh baptism of love for people. Y'all do too. And the third thing we need to do is we need to pray for our nation. Beloved, I, I'm not so sure we have not stepped across a precipice we can't come back from. To go from abortion, which was bad enough, to now open legalized infanticide, if the Spirit of God does not move in America, we're done. It's over. We need a fresh move of the Spirit of God. So can we pray for those three things right now? Lift up holy hands. And Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, hear your people as we cry out to you. I want you to pray right now. Spirit of God, give us strategy. Let us know how, Lord, we are to go and rescue these, these children, these abandoned discarded kids that are on the verge of death. Lord, you know our hearts. We want to help. We just don't know how to do it. God, make this church an example, a light, not only in this community, but in this nation, on how to step in and say, we'll take your children. We say it, we just don't know how to do it. Holy Spirit, give us wisdom. Would you pray for that, Ryan? Give us the strategy of the Spirit on how to do this. Pray for this right now. We need a fresh baptism of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the love of Jesus has been shed abroad in our heart. We need, just like we need a baptism of the Holy Spirit, we need a baptism of the love of the Lord Jesus. A love for people that we disagree with. A love for people who are broken, who are dirty, who are outcasts, who are hurt, who are dying. Lord God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you will break our hard hearts and give us a fresh love for people. Would you pray for that right now? No, I mean that. A love for people. I need that. Pray for it for you in this this church. Would y'all pray for our nation right now? I want y'all to pray for President Donald Trump. You say, he's not my president. Yeah, he is. And 1 Timothy says, you pray first of all for those who are leaders and authority. You pray for our president. You pray for our governor. You pray for our senators. You pray right now for that governor of New York, that he'll get born again saved. You pray for our nation. Father, we need a move of your Holy Spirit in America. Lord God, we need a fresh move of your Spirit. Father, we pray for our leaders right now. We pray, Lord God, that this evilness that has penetrated the hearts of so many legislators will be broken in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord God, I'm not praying they all get saved. I'm just praying that they'll start doing what's right, Father. God, we need this in our nation right now. Father, I thank you for this church. The last prayer you prayed before you went to the Father, before you went to the cross, was this. Father, make them one as you and I are one. God, I pray that over this congregation right now. Make us one even as you, Jesus, and the Father are one. May the enemy not divide and conquer over race, over socioeconomic mess. God, I pray that in a world that doesn't know how to do it right, they'll look at this church and see how it's done right. We are every tribe, tongue, and nation coming together under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Make us one even, Lord, as you and the Father are one. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is a work within us to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen and amen God bless you beloved let's go change this evil world for the Lord Jesus Christ God bless you